It's this weird myth, you know, to lose weight, we want to be on 1200 calories. And it's honestly the diet of a child. If you drop your energy intake down to 1200 calories, generally what we see in women is... Introducing Sally O'Neill. Nutritionist. An advocate for sustainable health. I went through an eating disorder for about maybe a year. You can have an eating disorder or an unhealthy relationship with food at any size. How much of your nutrition impacts your skin, hair and nails? Massively. A lot of people who've got eczema and psoriasis can benefit from taking omega-3s. Tell me what your food philosophy you live by today and is there anything that you love that might surprise us because you've never given it up? Definitely the 80-20 approach. I just love it so much because it's not a diet, it's an approach that's unrestrictive. So let's talk about the time where you actually were on the 1200 calorie diet. Talk me through how you felt. How did your body respond? I went from 58 kilos to 43. I was losing muscle, I was losing my hair, I lost my periods. I was infertile, I was moody, I was depressed. It was absolutely not worth the it health consequences. So I would be laid in bed, not being able to go to sleep, and then I would... Guys, welcome back to the Chew on This podcast. I have an incredible guest with me today, Sally, who is the founder of Status 8020, 8020, everything that we live and breathe at EQ. She's a nutritionist and I absolutely love everything that she represents, all of her content online is just educating about sustainable weight loss and how to enjoy life in the process. So super stoked to have you, Sally. I just want to chat about everything to do about the low calorie diet and 1200 calories, like really dive into that topic. Please, um, yeah. So just want to pick your brain and just dive into your background and your expertise. Awesome. Yeah. It's a, such a key topic for women specifically. I think it's just been this number that's floated around for so long it's this weird myth that goes around that we you know to lose weight we want to be on 1200 calories and it's honestly the diet of a child i can't understand why it's so per pervasive as a myth i still have people to this day that say to me shouldn't i just be on 1200 calories and i'm just like i can't know where the number came thing? yeah i <laughs> like, just where did it, it just picked? popped out of nowhere yeah. just and it's just so embedded in yeah. the our brains that we need to be eating less calories to achieve more but we'll dive into why that's not actually the way to do it yes so let's start i, I want to dive deep into just like a time in your life where your relationship with food or body had a significant impact on your mindset and how you navigated through this Oh, great question. Um, I should give a bit of backstory, I think, because it leads into your question. So I used to have a really fairly unhealthy diet, came from the UK, obviously, with this horrible accent. And I don't think I, it's horrible. Oh, cannot get rid of it. Everyone goes, are you having a nice holiday? Well, I've been in Australia 13 <laughs> years now. I still haven't changed my accent. Um, but I had quite a not great diet. It wasn't, I, I had a great relationship with food in the sense that I ate whenever I wanted, when I was hungry as much as I wanted. But it wasn't serving my body that well. So I, I was in my 20s. I'd literally eat bowls of cereal for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Then I moved to Australia when I was 24 and couldn't cook, had absolutely no cooking skills whatsoever. And I started to learn to cook because I couldn't afford to eat out all the time as a backpacker. So started to learn to cook, lost a load of weight. And in that process, and it was natural, it wasn't an intentional thing of trying to lose weight. But in that process, that was when Instagram was taking off. And my Instagram started to do really well off the back of my weight loss journey. And I got a lot of validation online and it became pretty toxic for me. So I ended up losing way more weight than I should have done and got diagnosed with what's called orthorexia. So my relationship with food basically just took a turn for the worst. And I went through an eating disorder for about maybe a year, which was very short stint, fortunately. Um, but ended up having psychologists and a big team of people to help me through it because it was just a it was a really rough time with my mental health and food, and so that was a huge turning point for me and a big lesson to say, what is the real um, configuration of what a healthy diet looks like for me, rather than just trying to make myself as small as possible? Is that really the healthiest version of me? And the answer was absolutely not. It actually messed with my brain chemistry and my relationship with food. And so that's what led to um, the balance of 80-20 and, and teaching people how to have a really good relationship with food. Because I've kind of experienced bad in two extremes of just eating whatever I wanted and then being really restrictive and now landing somewhere really healthily in the middle where I feel like my most vibrant self at a healthy weight. 
So back in your early 20s, when you embarked on this journey to coming to Australia, so what was your body type like then? Were you slim? Were you carrying a bit more weight? So how would you describe what you looked like back then when yeah. you were eating whatever? Whatever I wanted, definitely carrying a little bit more weight. I would say maybe five kilos over where I feel comfortable now. Um, but I definitely didn't have any relationship necessarily or a negative relationship with the mirror. I kind of didn't think about it, honestly, which is... I guess that childhood yeah. kind of naivety of like, yeah. I haven't been affected by the industry yet. I'm not concerned about what I look like. And again, this is pre-Instagram days, right? When no one was taking selfies in the gym. So it kind of was a nice headspace to be in, but I also wasn't serving my body with nutritious food. And that led me then into going into nutrition study and studying for six years because I really actually wanted to understand the science rather than just following people online and going on the latest fad, which I think we've all done. Oh, yeah. I did the 1200 calorie diet. I did, you know, the lemon detox and all the ridiculous things that people tell you are going to help you lose weight um, or even just get healthier because I thought that was my goal. And then I ended up just getting a lot of validation online and taking it too far. I am actually so baffled at the fact that you didn't know how to cook because I look at your content online because you do food photography and you create great recipes and great food content. So it's I, the comeback story we all needed, I think. I literally couldn't wow. boil an egg. Yeah, I couldn't boil an egg at 24. I, I had to send an email to my mom. I remember I hit Melbourne. That's where I first landed. And I sent her a message saying, hey, food's super, super expensive here compared to the UK and I can't eat out all the time. And they actually don't have my favorite. This is such a childish thing to say. They didn't have my favorite cereal. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And my mom sent me a list of really basic recipes. Like here's how to make a stir fry. Here's how to boil an egg. Here's how to cook chicken and not give yourself food poisoning. And I didn't even have an oven at the time. I only had like, I was living in... Um, I think it was like, ho like, it wasn't a hotel, but it was just like accommodation that wasn't really geared up for long-term stays. And I just had two um, hob burner hobs to cook off so everything got stir fried. So I was just trying to learn, like I boiled eggs in the kettle, put the whole thing in the yeah, kettle and I've did that, that trick. Hack, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, that's where I learned to cook. And then I've ended up in a weird roundabout way, having two cookbooks with publishers and ended up you know, doing the my food photography for it. So that I learned on just, YouTube and... That is so wild. Bit of a turnaround well, story. Well, if anyone <laughs> needed that, that this You can design, do anything. You can do anything. You can come from anywhere and become an incredible, amazing person, even if it's a weakness of yours. It turned that into a crazy. big skill, yeah. And I um, I learned on YouTube as well. So that wasn't a skill that it was just one of those things that I put in the hours and watched a couple of tutorials online. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to do my own cookbooks. Um, so yeah, that's, I spent a lot of hours practicing for that. And then, you know, just got thrown in the deep end doing the cookbooks. And I was like, I've got to really nail this quickly. And then ended up being a food photographer for like maybe seven or eight years working with like Jamie Oliver and Opera Bar and all these cool, cool brands and companies that I got to shoot for, which was really fun. That is I've done, so crazy. I think 10 cookbooks since. Wow. For other people. You. That's amazing. Yeah. What a great comeback. It's fun. I get to eat all day, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best. the best part about it. Absolutely. When we do recipe development and we're filming it, it's being able to actually try the food and you're like, oh, and those reactions. So like we film a lot of our reactions when we, like when I do like recipe reels or when someone in the team does it, that those reactions are real. Like it's the best. first bite and you're like, you're just like, how am I so good at this? Like, how did this actually turn out to be far more flavoursome than what I had anticipated? And you're like, damn, I'm, I'm such good a good at this. Cook. I know. It's such a little dopamine hit. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I'm actually quite good with food. It's surprising. But I have to say I'm one of those people who, because I speak about food all day, every day now to my clients and I am doing recipe testing and stuff. Sometimes I just get home and I'm like, I just want toast, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure chefs do the same where they're just like, I've been around food all day and I just want really plain, boring, quick to make stuff. So yeah. I kind of dance between the super exciting, delicious recipes and and then I'll go back again and be like, I just want beans on toast. Yeah, something so basic like yeah. eggs on toast for dinner Yum. and that's it. Or like a pot of yogurt and some, some like berries. berries. Yeah, yeah, and that's it. I'm done. Or a Girl protein dinner, shake. hundred yeah. <laughs> percent. So you essentially like, did you start your education on the back end of going through the journey of your eating disorder or did you actually start it earlier when you realised that you just weren't healthy? At what point did you start becoming educated on nutrition? It probably started pre-eating disorder. Yeah. Um, 
in the sense that I was doing a lot of research and I don't know that it came from a healthy space. It was just, I wanted more information and I'm going to try on, I'm sure everybody does it at home now, but it's like, I'm going to try on this diet. I'm going to learn about paleo or like why, how does paleo work? How does keto work? And I've got quite, um, I guess an inquisitive brain, sciencey brain, and I really want to know the mechanism of action behind everything. So like, if this is going to work, why does it work? And so I would spend hours trawling blogs, which was a big thing back then. And I ended up with a blog myself. And it was more just like, I wanted a better understanding of how my body was working with the foods that I was putting in. And I think I learned a little bit too much. Like they always say, ignorance is bliss, but I can quite easily now eyeball a plate of food and tell you, you know, how many calories are in it without tracking, you know, how many grams of fat are in an egg, that kind of stuff. So I became a little bit too educated about those things. And then I realized that gathering all that information online, I was the epitome of someone who had been led down the rabbit hole of social media and and blogs. And I'd tried everything on to the point where nothing was good for me. So I can't eat vegetables because they've got, you know, toxins in or parasites you know, um, pesticides and I shouldn't eat meat because it's bad for your heart. And I just went through this whole thing where I ended up with eating about five or six foods because that's all that was healthy for me. And that then led me into orthorexia. So I I was already very probably overly educated at the point where the eating disorder hit. But then when I launched my first cookbook, I realized that it actually did pretty well and I wasn't expecting it to. And I realized I was in the realm of uneducated people giving recipes and nutrition advice and it concerned me. It was actually at the time, I don't know if you remember this, there was um, a a chef called Pete Evans and he was quite popular on TV in that moment and he'd launched a book about um, diet food for babies and it got pulled from the shelves because it was deemed dangerous. And it made me really, really self-conscious about the fact that I didn't have a qualification because I was like, you know, you can be a chef, you can be big in the eyes of social media, but you don't have the nutrition understanding. So I freaked out. I went to um, a friend who had a nutrition degree and said like, where did you learn? What, you know, is it important for me to learn this stuff? And she put me in contact with the uni and I just signed up for a degree there. And then I was like, let's go. I'm, I I already had a degree in business, but I was like back to, back to education at 30 years old. Um, I was like a considered a geriatric student, which killed me. Um, and then went back to uni and did it part time for five and a half years. So what did you learn on social media and online in these blogs and just in the online space versus what did university teach you? Oh, was there conflicting views? Hugely, hugely. Um, and I think that's the danger of social media, but also like the joy of social media because you get so much information and you yeah. can find out whatever you want to find out on social media, right? But if you take too many people's opinions on, it becomes this plethora of like really conflicting information. And I think that's what I see my clients struggle with so much. Like we've read this works and this works and now I don't know what the hell to do at all. So uni taught me really specifically how to read a journal which is so important so if I read something on social media now I'll be like let me look at the science behind this which I think has given me this really beautiful way of assessing information that really cuts to the core of something and not a lot of people um I shouldn't say not a lot that's unfair I think more and more people are doing it now but I don't know that people have the time and the energy to sit and read through scientific journals and know how to interpret them properly. So it gave me that incredible knowledge that I think's really helped. Um, But it also took me right back to the beginning of chemistry, which I actually wasn't very good at in school. I was more like an artsy girl. And I had to learn cell division again and about enzymes and all this like, rea- you know, reaction stuff in you in um, test tubes. I'm like, God, this is so not for me. I had to do that for two years and I really struggled with it. And then when I got into the juice of like and how diets work, how carbohydrates work, how molecules work after digestion, that's the stuff now that makes more sense to me. So that scientific baseline of mechanism of action, of understanding like if I eat less carbs, what actually happens in the body with water retention intramuscularly and things like that, yeah. that gives me a solid understanding of going, now I understand how all diets work rather than thinking there's some mythical thing that I haven't grasped yet. And it's just this new magical thing that I should jump onto, which is what I used to think. Like there's something I don't know here, I should just only meet. 
now I understand the mechanism behind why a diet works or why it doesn't work and what the health consequences of it are, good or bad. Yeah, and also why the scales fluctuate as well. 100%. Depending on what you eat. So what you consume, the amount of carbohydrates and, and so on, the amount of sodium you have in your diet. It just like previously, like jumping on a scale, you'd be like, why is my weight going up? Yeah. I'm dieting. Absolutely. I've like cut everything out. So why? But is... I'm also strength training and eating more carbohydrates and I had soy sauce last yeah. night and like yep. a million different yep. things. You have answers now. Absolutely. Which, unfortunately, social media doesn't give you that, but the facts do, science does. Yeah. And that's essentially what university would have taught you, right? Yeah, yeah. And now, which is a really beautiful thing, I try and use my degree and simplify it in a really entertaining and educating yeah. way to make it into these 10 second snippets for social media so that we can cut through the noise from people who aren't educated or don't have that understanding of the science of the mechanism of action and things as I was speaking about. So I think that's that's how I've drawn an audience because people actually want, they're really looking for specialists now, which is great. I think there's a lot of people on social media that have come out that are incredible biohackers and neuroscientists and and people are leaning more towards that information yeah. now because they know it's grounded in evidence and science and, and that's a really beautiful thing. What would you say has been the most, um, I guess, sought after topic uh, when it comes to your content that you've produced? Like what do you think has gone or performed the most because that's what people, what answers people are looking for? Always fat loss because yeah. there's so much confusion about the best way of going around it. And it was not something that I was ever super focused on, honestly, as a nutritionist. I'm always all about optimizing health. Yeah. Sometimes for some people that includes fat loss, but it, not always. And often people will come to me, I guess, maybe slightly misinformed ladies who are in the 40s and 50s who have been th lived through growing up in that really like low fat diet era who are really calorie counting and they'll say to me I want to be more defined I just want to lose five ten kilos but they've never done any strength training to build up muscle to show definition yeah. so let's start there and actually build calories would be my response so there's a, there's quite a lot of um, ladies that come to me who actually don't know what they want because they've been misinformed and it's my job to guide them. But specifically, there's interest in fat loss and also perimenopause. A massive amount of ladies come to wow. me that are struggling with symptoms of perimenopause, redistribution of um, fat storage, which is something we see a lot when estrogen declines and saying, hey, I've got belly fat that I never had before. I'm eating the same. I'm moving the same. Why is this happening? And there's just this really like strong resistance to bodies changing through the years and going, I still want to look like when I was 20, why is this not working? People just putting more and more and more effort in, yeah. thinking it's going to equal the body that they had. And really we just, we need to adopt and change our methods. Absolutely. But also just to embrace like where you Absolutely. are in your life cycle as well. Like it's okay. Hugely. Yeah. yeah. I think, I, yeah. There's a lot of ick in leaning into it. I've yeah. experienced that. I'm 37 now and I'm kind of like, wow, my body is very different. And it responds a lot differently to um, cortisol levels, for example. Like yeah. I used to thrive off cortisol. Now my body's like, we are not doing this no. anymore. We need lots of rest days. We yeah. need Pilates. <laughs> we need to do like intense strength training, but only two, three, four days a week as opposed to smashing myself six days a week. Yeah. So my training and approach has changed drastically as well with age. And I think we have a lot more tolerance. I know we have a lot more tolerance with cortisol when we're younger. Um, and our bodies, as women specifically, really struggle with it as we age. Things like intermittent fasting as well that yeah. elevate cortisol, that kind of stuff. Um, we just want to be more careful with as we move through the ages, right? And yeah. that's something that I think a lot of women are confused by because they'll look at 20-year-olds that have got great bodies on social media and go, well, I just need to do what she's doing. I just need to do more of that but it's like, darling, you're 45 and yeah. that's not going to help you get to where you want to be. It's a completely different approach. We need to look at your thyroid. We need yeah. to get your iodine up. We need to look at, you know, incidental exercise because you've got an office job now. That kind of stuff it becomes more important. Yeah, absolutely. So you did touch on calories. You said yes. that you know how to eyeball, you know, the <laughs> serving size of, some, of something, how many calories it contains and, you know, the macronutrient split. So how many grams of fat an egg has. So tell me, was there a specific aha moment that clarified the importance of understanding calorie intake for you? Probably the eating disorder, interestingly. Not that I would ever 
suggest that anyone goes down that route to the point where they're so obsessed with calories and numbers and things. But I think what I realized, realizing that I was at my unhealthiest was the trigger moment for me to go, I need to get on top of this. This is not at all what I was wanting out of me trying to be my healthiest self. And that's where it came out of was, I want to be as healthy as possible, which led me being more sick than I'd ever been. Yeah. And my brain couldn't compute the two things. It didn't make any sense. I'm like, I'm training for three hours a day and I'm eating, you know, just salad and protein. Like, why is my body reacting in a way where I'm lethargic and I'm depressed and this I'm not thriving? Yeah. Um, and then actually getting a real solid understanding of actually I need fats for hormone production and a, a really good level of those and for luteinizing hormone um, pulsation. So I have periods as an example, because I lost my periods, I lost my hair. So things like that, I think I've realized the balance of micros and macros. Um, I think macros get a lot of airtime at the moment, which is yeah. great, but micros seem to get pushed a little bit to one side. So I've realized the balance of that by kind of testing it on myself and taking it too far. Um, and yeah, I can eyeball now, which is pretty great. It means I don't necessarily have to track because I think yeah. a lot of people try and find tracking quite triggering as well. Yeah. Um, and just time consuming sometimes for people. So yeah. it's trying to find methods that work within everybody's busy lives that will help them find that lovely balance. And as you'll know, some people thrive better off high carbs, some prefer high fat. And then we've got ladies that have got endometriosis, PCOS, and you know, um, insulin resistance who benefit from different macros as well and yeah. just like slight adjustments to that. So it's really learning what works for your individual body. And yeah, sure, taking a bit of info from social media if that's helpful or, or from a coach or from an app, but really learning, hey, I tried that on for two, three, four weeks and it didn't serve me. Now I need to adjust my approach and then sticking with the approach that works for a decent period of time. We're so impatient right? yeah. oh. as women. <laughs> We want oh, everything then, yesterday, as I like to say. Um, but yeah, we all just want a quick fix. Absolutely. Like, oh, I wanted to lose five kilos last week. Absolutely. And so we try and rush the process and we try and find something that's going to give it to us quite quick, but it's so detrimental. And we and lose muscle mass, absolutely. metabolism goes down. Absolutely. And then we're back to square one. So of all of the approaches that you've tried, which sounds like many, like, <laughs> like most of our listeners out there, <laughs> Tell me what your food philosophy you live by today. And is there anything that you love that might surprise us because you've never given it, given it up? Oh, um, so definitely the 80-20 approach, which I know you're a big proponent of as well. And that's probably stuck with me for the like the last five or six years, which I I just love it so much because it's it's not a diet, it's an approach that's unrestrictive. Yeah. But it also means that I'm getting those micronutrients in, obviously, from 80% whole foods and then 20%. I want to go out for brunch on a weekend with my girlfriends and have a beautiful social time and not stress about, you know, am I getting the amount of fats or protein or, you know, is this toast going to, you know, push me over on carbs? I don't have to worry about that stuff. It just gives me a really beautiful amount of freedom and it's enough to keep me adherent. And we know from the studies that anybody who embarks on a diet to lose weight the, the one determinant of those who are successful is people who adhere long term. Yeah. That's all we need. So if you find that you can adhere to a keto diet because you just really love high fat foods and that works for you and you can stay in a deficit, great. Stay on the keto diet. If you're amazing on high carb and you just really love carbohydrates and you can consume that regularly and you can lose that weight that way in a deficit, stay on that. It's just about finding the thing that works for you. But I find for the majority of my clients, I, and yet I actually don't think I found one of my clients who doesn't like the 80-20 approach. It's just so easy to adhere to and it just makes dieting that much more pleasurable if your goal is to lose fat. What does 80-20 mean to you? Oh, I think it's the balance that I wish somebody had taught me when be prior to my eating disorder. And it means that I just have a really beautiful relationship with food that I've never experienced before. Like I said, I was on one extreme where I was just eating really processed food and the other extreme of being super restrictive and only eating like a handful of foods that were I thought were super nutritious. 
and then coming together and finding that really beautiful balance of actually fueling my body appropriately for the amount of exercise that I do and for my goals and making sure that, you know, I'm having great periods. I've got hair, like my hair's back. I feel optimal. I wake up with energy. My sleep's good. And of course, it's not always that way, but it gives me a really good baseline jumping off point. Um, and that's what 8020 has given me. So it really is just my my baseline for all my health and kind of my happiness as well, I think. It's like you get all of the good stuff, but you allow yourself to just be a little bit more flexible and enjoy life in the process, which is most mm. important. So you're thriving, you're glowing, you're full of energy, your mood's great, your hair's growing, which is important, which a lot of women actually don't realise how much of your nutrition impacts your hair, hair, like your skin, hair and nails. Massively. Ma so I, I was actually speaking to someone the other day and they were telling me about um, just them experiencing hair loss. And I was like, well, what's your diet like? Yes. Because it, it plays such a big part, right? Yeah, um, zinc, omegas, and like making yeah. sure you're getting enough selenium, iodine, yeah. all this stuff that these micronutrients, right, that we, we kind of go, oh, my diet's okay. But specifically even things like eczema, for example, a lot of people who've got eczema and psoriasis can benefit from taking omega-3s. Yeah. I had a lady in my DMs the other day who had been taking like, or putting on um, cortisone cream for years years and nobody's ever mentioned it to her and she came back to me um and said I, I cannot believe I've been seeing dietitians and um and and dermatologists and nobody's mentioned from the inside out what I should be doing to help with my skin it's always been topical which is so interesting that it's it, people aren't looking at diet when the specialists in that arena and obviously all specialists have their lane that they need to stay in and and gps aren't spending hours and hours on nutrition but definitely um seek advice from lots of different people if you're struggling with hair skin and things like hair skin and nails because there's many ways you can tackle yeah. issues like that and symptoms yeah and i th i feel like um a lot starts with what you consume definitely like a lot of the problems that you're facing usually comes from your diet so when people are like oh, i just have no energy i'm so fatigued all the time or mm. you know like I'm just not feeling my best or whatever it may be. It's yeah. like, well, let's how talk. many coffees are we having a day, yeah. sweetheart? <laughs> Until what time? time? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it just plays such a big part Huge. in our life. It's so important. So let's actually like dive into the 1200 calorie diet. So why do you think that number has become that magical number that everyone claims it to be and that one number that people are like, I need to lose weight I'm going to consume 1,200 calories. Why do you think? Originally, and this is my understanding, so I'm sure other people have got takes on it, but originally the number was put out there because it was the minimum amount we assume or the science assumed that you could consume to hit your micronutrient requirements so that you weren't deficient. So you generally need to eat in the a minimum of 1,200 calories to ensure that you're not deficient in Bs, iron, like vitamin D, that kind of stuff. Um, if you ate less than that, just the literally the volume that you were consuming, you can't get in all the vitamins and minerals that you need to thrive. So it became a bit of a baseline of as lo if you hit 1200, you're not going to be deficient in anything, but you're going to be at the minimum you can basically consume to, uh, to lose weight at the same time. It was that in theory, it was supposed to be that sweet spot of like, let's just hit the baseline of vitamins and minerals. Wow. That's where it came from. And that's from. assuming that you're eating all the right foods to hit them as well. A range, a variety, yeah. that the quality of your food is great. We know that a lot of it goes in cold storage for yeah. months from the supermarket. So yeah, it's it's very tricky to say that that 1200 is a is a good mark for anyone. It's, it's crazy to me, but the myth pervades. So I have a lot of people that say, well, I am on 1200 calories, but I'm not losing weight. Sure. So what are the possible reasons as to why they're not actually losing weight on 1200 calories, do you think? So we know energy expenditure is built from essentially four components of expenditure. So we're looking at, at basal metabolic rate, which you would know is a lot of that is based off muscle mass, age, height, weight, all that jazz. Um, then we've got non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is fidgeting essentially and, and basically keeping the lights on if you want to think of it like that. So inhaling, exhaling, keeping your heart pumping, all that jazz. Um, then we've got the exercise component and then we've got 
thermic effect of food or TEF. And that's the energy it takes to take some protein from your mouth, put it into your digestion, break it down and get it doing its thing in your body. So putting it to use. Um, and so the, of those four components, when we're thinking about 1200 calories, if you drop your energy intake down to 1200 calories, generally what we see in women is your NEAT goes down a lot. So it's not that I mean, you may do less steps because you're less energized, but also people fidget significantly less. They blink slower. They gesture less. And all of this stuff really, really adds up to energy expenditure in the day. So when we're trying to find that balance, you actually need to find the sweet spot of energy output for you, like optimizing your energy output and consuming the right amount of energy to lose the weight that you want to lose at a rate that is sustainable and safe. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong as well, because they might have a maintenance calorie of say 2000 and they drop it. They go, oh, I'm just going to go straight on to the 1200. Oh my goodness. We're losing muscle mass straight away. There's water loss, which is, you know, it's okay. Um, but it's the muscle mass that concerns me. And you don't need to go that low. For most ladies, you really don't need to. Um, and the speed at which you lose weight matters. So yeah. we know that people who lose weight slowly keep it off long term. People who lose weight quickly think it's about a 90% hit rate of putting it back on. It's significantly, significantly elevated. That's so crazy. Do you think that also... Um, I find that why a lot of people that don't uh, lose weight on 1200 calories is because they're actually tracking wrong and they think and are, st are so confident that yeah. they're hitting 1200 calories. Yeah. But when you speak to them about what they're eating in their day and you're like, okay, well, tell me what you're actually eating. Yeah. It actually goes from 1200 to about 2000 real yes. quick because they're not so accounting quick. for their oat latte, the honey that they've put into it. The, the little nibbles they had while they Licks were cooking dinners. Licks of spoons. Dinners. Yep. All Just the things. handful of nuts. You know, the, the oil that was in their salad dressing that they're like, oh, my salad is only 200 calories. No, it's actually probably closer to six or 700, yes. which is half of your 1,200 calories that you're consuming. Absolutely. So do you think that could be a big reason as to why people that claim they're on 1,200 calories are not losing weight as well? Definitely. It's it's definitely that. I see that a lot is that women, I think we underreport by 20%. Most people, even, even 50%. people. Oh, 50. Statistics show wow. that people underreport by 50 percent because people assume That's and huge. don't realize the actual um measurement of an, an item and how many calories it contains yeah they're like oh i'm having a serving of cereal and it's like you know it looks like a bowl but it's actually double what the manufacturer oh, yeah. considers a serve two servings yes and if they just put it on the scale to so actually weigh it just for one time to see how much they're actually consuming, they would be so shocked. Shocked, yeah, yeah, yeah massively. Um, it, it's it's a bit of a scam, honestly, by food companies saying, the serve, don't get me started on serving sizes because the serving sizes for mice, I'm like, nobody is eating like a palm size amount of granola. Nobody's doing that. A Kit Kat Chunky has like three servings <laughs> and I'm like, that is a one person it's chocolate bar. I am not sharing my Kit Kat Chunky with nobody's, anyone. <laughs> nobody's having half a Kit Kat Chunky. Like it's, uh, I'll just save that for later. Nobody's no. doing that. It's ridiculous no. yeah um but so yes there's the obviously the under reporting we also need to remember that there is actually a 20 percent variation on food labels yeah. so if something says it's 100 calories it could actually be 120 calories that's to do with seasonal fluctuations with ingredients for example and i only know this because i used to have a food company that was like a protein ball mix company years ago did you um yeah another another weird string to my bow <laughs> i started out at bondi farmers markets and ended up having 350 50 stores across Australia and then sold the business. So I was like, I'm overwhelmed. Um, but I, yeah, I didn't know with the labeling laws, I obviously had to dive into labeling laws and um, I, yeah, you can swap in and out yeah. ingredients without changing the nutrition label as long as it's a fairly good match yeah. because of supply. So for example, if my cacao said it was from Peru, I could then go and get it from somewhere else because there was no supply and the label didn't need to change. And that's legal, that's fine. 
Um, but the fat content in the cacao bean might be different because it's from a different breed of um, cacao tree, for example, in which case there's a variation in calories. People don't know that when they're reading labels. So even the most fastidious people who are tracking can still be out by 20%. That's huge. Yeah, and if you think about it, if you're on 2,000 calories um, and all of your all of the ingredients that you've consumed are over by 20%, you're what, over by... Is it 200? Is it two? Am I forgetting my maths right? 200 calories. No, 400 calories. Yes. 400 calories. Yeah, it's a lot. That can put you in a a surplus. Absolutely. It's enough to completely throw you off your goals. Yeah, it's just crazy. And the the final thing that I see a lot is people do the the 1,200 calories for, say, five days. And then day six, it's like, I've been good all week. I'm not going to track on a Saturday. I'm going out. Which, you know, I am all for, like, one on track to social meal a week is what I always get my girls to do. If, you, if you're if you on, a like, a VIP program with me, I'm like, one on track social meal a week. Enjoy it. Knock yourself out. And do the 80-20 every day. I want you to have a treat a day. But I want you to be aware of how much of that treat you're having and what that how that adds up in your, in your daily intake. But... I think people will start on something and they'll go, oh, well, you know, breakfast was totally off. So today doesn't count. So I'm just not going to track anything. And I'm just going to use that as a window to eat whatever I want. So what looked like once was a healthy week that put them in a great deficit. They can go from consuming 1,200 calories a day on a weekend, not realizing they're then at 3,000 on a Saturday and then go, oh, I'm not losing any weight. This is ridiculous. I mean, drastically puts the foot on the brake with weight loss. Yeah, absolutely. So that variation, it's frustrating. It's essentially like a yo-yo every week, like yo-yo dieting every week where we have a cheat meal or we have a whatever and it actually drastically throws off the numbers. So it's trying to find the right balance for people where they don't feel like they have to vacate their diet, right? Yeah, and I think what people don't realise is that the body doesn't recognise it in a 24-hour period. So just because you ate 1,200 calories one day, it doesn't mean that you're going to jump on the scales tomorrow and lose weight. You probably will. You'll see a fluctuation in your weight because you're consuming just volume is a lot less, carbs are probably less. Um, so you will see that drop. But over a, a longer period of time, you're putting yourself in a surplus if you're having these binge weekends. So you've gone from having those 1200 calories to potentially averaging out to about 2,500 per day, which is probably just a little bit too much than you should be consuming if you're on a weight loss journey. Yeah. Um, it's just so crazy. And I think also consistency is, so, is just key. Just building those habits to be consistent day in, day out. Because if you're someone that is, you know, eating quite low during the week and then the weekend comes, and you're like, whatever. Saturday and Sunday, I'm going to eat from start to finish whatever I want. I'm going to go get, you know, uh, an acai bowl that has so much peanut butter. And then I'm going to go and get whatever, like a burger for lunch. And then I'm going to go and drink a bottle of wine and get Messina for dinner, right? Yeah, yeah. But the, the alcohol does get everybody. I will oh, say that it's when you start realize. looking at how many calories are in a cocktail. You're like, I'm never drinking those bad boys again. It's so disappointing. And people are like, oh, and but vodka straight or tequila straight. It's just a spirit. It has no calories. I'm like, no, you one shot has 70 calories. Like it still contains something, and it it needs to come from somewhere. So and like I look at alcohol as just like straight poison, right? There is no macro or micronutrient component to, to alcohol, yep. and so you're essentially then not getting enough protein or getting enough fats or whatever it may be. Absolutely. Because people are like, oh, just sub out my omelette. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't <laughs> work like that, <laughs> I'm so sorry, wouldn't that be great? Yeah, no, it definitely doesn't work like that. Yeah. I always think it's like when people say it's empty calories, it, it really, literally it is. really is. Like there's no nutrients coming from that thing. And yeah. I think I always try and get ladies to look at um, – I shouldn't exclude men, actually, sorry. I get people to look at food on a scale of rather than bad and good. What I Because I, people love to label foods bad and good. Yeah. It, it drives me insane. But I think you, we need to think about what we consider bad is actually just nutrient poor. So yeah. it, ha- it doesn't have the micronutrients or it's high in calories. And that's how people are looking at it. So if you look at what's nutrient poor versus nutrient dense and then try and stay up the nutrient dense end of the spectrum most of the time, It honestly is that simple. Like you don't need to complicate your diet more than that. But people will try and hack the system, as you just said, and they'll try and go nutrient poor, but in a deficit. Yeah. And then they feel rubbish. And that's the difference. Their body composition changes. You can can definitely lose weight by eating Twinkies all day if you eat less than you burn. 
However, <laughs> you're going to feel absolutely terrible because you're getting no vitamins, no minerals, yeah. no fiber. Your gut health's going to be no really protein. unhappy. No protein. Maintain muscle mass. Yeah. Absolutely. So it just doesn't work in that way where you can be like, I'm going to sub out. You know, I'm not going to have breakfast. I'm just going to have my calories in coffee. Oh, darling, you're going to feel terrible. Yeah. So it's it's really just trying to stay up that end of the spectrum of like really just nutritious foods and learning to love nutritious foods because it comes with a palate change for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but it comes with repetition and you actually learn how to make veggies delicious and you just love eggs. And then when you get offered junkier food, you're less inclined to actually want it. Like speaking on a podcast yesterday and someone said, what's your junk food of choice and I was like I don't know, probably chocolate if we're calling that junky it's probably not that nutritious yeah. but I wouldn't snatch your hand off for a McDonald's or a KFC oh, just genuinely no. and that's not because I'm restrictive I genuinely don't enjoy the taste and the texture of it it's kind of soggy to me like I'd probably do grilled or I love something so much we've spoken about this <laughs> um so great but yeah there's certain things that I would not go past the Maccas and smell it and be like that's for me I just have no interest in it no there's nothing better than just having like a good bowl of just like veggies like and meat and just like it and just like tastes a salmon so poke good. bowl yeah. any day it's just filled and yeah. it's just so nourishing and it just tastes so good tastes I'm fresh. much like yourself if I was if I had to choose between like a dirty burger versus like a grilled burger loaded with veggies and, and whatnot, I just think it tastes so much better. I agree. Like I would go down the grilled path 100 times over. And also like to talk on like the whole junk food thing and like chocolate and whatnot. If someone offers you, like if I was to offer you a donut today or a, a piece of chocolate or a chocolate bar, you'd really just assess like, do I feel like, it? am I craving it? And then you'd say yes or no. But I find that people that have a poor relationship with food or restrict themselves Monday to Friday, mm. at any opportunity they get offered it, they're like, yeah, give it to me. Yeah. But I'm not going to be able to stop. I need to have the whole block or I'm going to have to have the whole dozen of donuts. Yes. And so I think that what this whole 80-20 approach does, it it allows you to have it in moderation whenever you want so that when you crave it, you can have it so that when it gets presented to you outside of your craving period, you actually can say no, which I think is such an empowering feeling to so say empowering. no to something like that. Yeah. And go, I actually don't feel like it. I really liken it to the housing market, the supply and demand of the housing market. So if there's... Um, a really high demand for a property, for example, obviously the value of it shoots up and you create demand by creating a small amount of those things available. So for example, there's no apartments available in Sydney right now and the value of them has gone as shot up, right? Because there's minimal access. And if you do that with chocolate, you provide yourself minimal access, the desire shoots up tenfold. So when you're presented with it, you've got so much value attached to that thing that you want to get as much as possible, as quickly as possible. And it's this just like, I need to have it, even if your body's not wanting it, yeah. because you don't know when you're going to get supply again. Whereas if you provide regular supply and there's lots of it and you know it's abundant and you can have it whenever you want. So if there was thousands and thousands of apartments that were all stunning and white interiors and, oh, yeah like this is brilliant and uh, but if there was thousands of them available the price would have dropped drastically because the demand is diminished yeah so it's that supply and demand if you give yourself supply mentally and say i can have this whenever i want the demand and the value that you place on the thing drastically drops oh, and absolutely. then you can build that empowering relationship with food that's a really great analogy i love that that's awesome so let's talk about the time where you actually were on the 1200 calorie diet. Talk me through how you felt. How did your body respond? Extri so it's interesting. At the very start, I felt empowered by it because I felt like I'd hacked something. And I was energized. I was like, I've got the key to weight loss. This is brilliant. This is all I need to do. If I can just repeat this every day, this is what I'm going to be like the leanest, healthiest version of me. And... I, I had a very strict routine with the foods because I because I didn't want to weigh every day. And I, th at this point, I had an office job. I would turn up and it would be like, I even remember now, it's so ridiculous. I would wake up, I'd train, I'd do one protein shake, I'd give it two hours, I'd have a Chobani yogurt with a handful of blueberries, 
that was breakfast, that was it. And then it would get to lunchtime and it would be a tuna salad with no dressing, which was literally like 200 calories. And then I'd go for a walk at lunchtime and then I'd try and get extra steps in mid afternoon. And then I'd have like a certain amount of boiled eggs and some more veggies and then a dessert. And, and like, it was just repeated. So it was the same food day in, day out because it was so controlled, which again, isn't a healthy approach with food. The more you control you add, the poorer I think your relationship yeah. becomes. Um, so I felt really empowered in a weird way at the very start. I was kind of like, oh, this is great. I'm dropping weight. This is fantastic. It's a quick fix, but it can stay with me and it's working and I'm really impatient. So it gave me all the dopamine. And then quite quickly, and I would say maybe within a month of being on that 1200 calorie mark, I was not sleeping. So my sleep went from about seven and a half hours, which is what I need, to about five hours. Really drastically cut my sleep efficiency. I would be laid in bed, not being able to go to sleep. And then I would be in bed and I'd wake up in the middle of the night. And then I would wake up at ridiculous o'clock in the morning and couldn't go back to sleep. And that was, I really struggled with sleep. And that was lack of calories. Um, also not wanting to exercise because my energy had dropped drastically, my intake, then I was so lethargic that going to the gym was a chore. And I used to love going to the gym. It was my happy place. It was like where I got my, my I always say it's my therapist, but I would literally drag myself into the gym and be like, right now I've got to exercise. Now I'm so tired. And I would do the exercise and just really dread going again the next day. So it didn't take long for it to do a full like 180 and me actually be like, this is just not serving me, but I'm in a routine now and I'm getting the results. So don't change it. I was so stuck to the idea that this is the approach that I had to take. And because I've got those quick results, I was like, this is me for life. I'm set. So I just hit repeat every day, every day. I did it for eight months. And I went from 58 kilos to 43 kilos. <gasps> Guys, Please do not listen to this thinking that this is how so you should lose weight. So unhealthy. Do not recommend it at all. Don't recommend it. I don't think anybody should be losing more than 0.25, unless you've got lots and lots and lots yeah. of weight to lose. 0.25 kilos a week is a good rate of weight loss for most people. And we become so impatient. People want to lose a kilo a week or even half a kilo. And that's when we start to see muscle mass loss. I was losing muscle, I was losing my hair, I lost my periods, I was infertile, I was moody, I was depressed. It was absolutely not worth the it health consequences. So, not worth it. so did you at one point of this eight month journey of um, consuming 1200 calories, notice that your weight loss was slowing down or completely plateau? I definitely plateaued towards the, towards the last two, two months, I would yeah. say. Um, but I, I think that was because I'd lost muscle mass and I'd also lost so much energy, the fidgeting, the blinking, my, my heart rate actually slowed drastically as well. Um, I was cold all the time, oh, yeah. just like permanently cold. I actually found it too, this sounds ridiculous. I, when I would sit for long periods of time, I would get really, really sore bum because I had no fat on me that I, my bum would hurt from being sat down because my sit bones were literally against wood or whatever I was sat on. So I couldn't sit down for a long period of time. Like it was, it was ridiculous. The, the symptoms I got off the back of it and it absolutely plateaued to the point where I then felt like, well, I need to drop them further, which again, terrible idea. I think I ended up deciding in that moment that I was just going to burn more. So I'll just exercise and I'll run. So I ended up going to the gym twice a day at that point. Um, and then I was diagnosed with exercise addiction. So that came off the back of, well, what do I do now? I'm so low weight and I'm not dropping anymore. How do I be healthier? I know I'll exercise even more. And I would sit on a bike then for an hour after work. Ridiculous. Again, got all the terrible symptoms, went to a GP and said, that's weird. My period stopped. And she was like, step on a scale. And that's when I got diagnosed. She actually diagnosed me with anorexia. And I said, my preoccupation is not with being thin. I don't actually want to be super thin. I want to be the my healthiest self. I'm more concerned about 
the cleanness of the foods I'm putting in my body and optimal performance. But interestingly, I think it's just gone too far. I went and got a second opinion. They were like, it's orthorexia, it's a different thing. So it's a preoccupation with being healthy as opposed to a preoccupation with being thin. That's just wild. That's, yeah, it's, that's so crazy. It's really hard to compute that you can be too healthy. I think that's what I really struggled with to the point where it's actually detrimental. But also like, what is healthy? I think healthy um, and defining like good health is so different for everyone. Yeah. And I think like I look at that case and to me that the extreme measures and like the obsession and the full control to me doesn't seem healthy because your mindset is not in a good place and I think a lot of people neglect your the mental health element and also your relationship with food but how can you say that you've got good health when this like your mind is just not in its best place yeah and you can be any size and not have a good relationship with food yeah. or be considered orthorexic or anorexic which a lot of people don't realize yeah. because it's your preoccupation, it's the mental health component that creates or is, um, that th essentially will give you the eating disorder, if that makes yeah. sense. So I, ha I continue, my eating disorder still existed when I was at a healthy weight because my relationship with food hadn't changed. I had just, dis I had consumed more and stopped exercising as much, but my preoccupation with this food needs to be super healthy, it needs to be organic, I can't eat out at restaurants because I don't know what oil they've used, I can't have seed oils, I can't have this, I can't have a bite of chocolate. That was still like wow. continuously going around in my brain. And it was, to the point where it affected my daily living and that was still considered an eating disorder. So you can have an eating disorder or an unhealthy relationship with food at any size. And if you concerned about it at all, I spoke a lot with the, um, the Butterfly Foundation who are incredible. They had an online chat service when I was going through it and I reached out to them all the time. I was like, I need a counselor right now because I am not coping in this situation. And it gave me a bit of reprieve or guidance in the moment. I think often when you book in to see a psychologist or psychiatrist, it's weeks away from yep. your your moment when you're desperate. So I found that chat function incredibly helpful. And I, I find that a lot of girls don't know about that service. Um, so I think accepting that you your body can look healthy and you can have an eating disorder and, or an unhealthy relationship or a preoccupation with food. You can be on the bigger side or more curvy or more voluptuous. You can have a really great relationship with food. You can also have a poor relationship with food. It's not size dependent. No. It's it's symptom dependent a lot of the time. Like you yep. can have the hair loss, the periods, or you- Lack of energy. Absolutely, yep. high blood pressure. Yeah. Those are the things we wanna be looking out for, for what is actually a determinant of health and whether absolutely. you're functioning How well. How you feel is so important. And I think a lot of people neglect that in this entire process and journey. It's less about how you look, but it's more about how you feel, absolutely. which is so important. So how did you actually like overcome that? Like what, what did you do? What was that breakthrough for you? Like what- because you were trying to exercise less and consume more, but in the back of your mind, you were still reminding yourself. It would have taken a lot of like retraining of the brain. Like what actually changed for you to overcome that period of time in your life? Yeah, I think, so I hit rock bottom, which was for me, I was diagnosed with depression off the back of it. Um, I will say I was very fortunate that it only lasted about two months, clinically depressed, to the point where I found no joy in things that I'd found joy in previously. Like I, I, I don't even know how to describe it. I think unless you've experienced it, it's impossible to describe how miserable and deadpan and you almost feel completely emotionless mm -hmm. that you have no reaction to anything. Like I didn't want to be with my partner, but I didn't want to be in bed and I didn't want to see anyone or interact with anyone or do anything. I just didn't want to do anything and nothing brought me joy. And I think at that point, I was like, I am not fueling my brain and my body in a way that is actually serving me. And I have to turn this around against my better judgment at this moment because I think my brain was trying, I had these two voices, yeah, of you need to um, exercise more and eat less. And then there was this other side of me, I know that's actually not what my body needs right now. 
and trying to lean into that voice more and saying, you've got to win. You have to win this out. Otherwise, I'm going to be really sick. Um, that was the turning point for me of just being diagnosed, I think, was like, I, I'm not the girl who has an eating disorder. This is insane to me. And so I have to turn this around. So I think then when I actually started fueling my body appropriately for the amount of exercise that I was doing, I realized how badly I'd actually been feeling because it was a slow demise. And then when I hit rock bottom and I lost my periods in my hair, I was like, huh, that's interesting that this is all starting to come. Yeah. I'm back on the up now and I'm starting to feel so much better. And then I realized that I've got to keep this up. It's not about being your smallest self. Or it's not about being your most restrictive, controlled, in in air quotes, healthiest self or what I thought was my healthiest self of not having carbs and not having fat and not having calories and blah, blah, blah. It was actually letting go of control that led me to having a healthier body, better skin, more energy. Um, but then finding that good relationship with food that gave me so much freedom. Um, and then my brain joined the party and said, we don't need to keep talking about this with you all day. Um, and my brain health got a lot better as well. Like my neurotransmitters were happier. I had more dopamine, more serotonin. I could go out and socialize again. So it was definitely a journey. It took me about a, a year or maybe even two years to get completely out of. Um, but all off the back of that 1,200 calorie diet. Wow. So in your journey towards healthier habits, have there been moments recently, you know, over the last year or so, where you found yourself slipping back into old patterns you now advise against? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I definitely have to rein in my exercise because I really love exercise. It sounds funny. I never used to love it. I started exercising because I was having panic attacks and it was to help control anxiety when I was like 18. They gave me, uh, the GPs gave me some um, diazepam to control my, what were then quite frequent panic attacks that I was experiencing from anxiety. But they also said, if you're gonna take this, you also need to go to the gym. And I was like, sure, I'll go to the gym. And I actually started going and realized that it made me feel great about myself and it reduced my anxiety a lot. And so I became almost dependent on movement then to control anxiety. I made that connection in my brain. So I still, when I feel anxious or overloaded or overwhelmed with work, I will turn to exercise still. And I still have to coach myself and say, you've already trained today or you've you've strength trained three times this week. Your body's tired. You don't need more. You do not need more. Go for a slow walk with a girlfriend. So I definitely still have moments where I have to re-coach myself. And I think because I genuinely love it and I do get the dopamine rush and, you know, the fun from doing the exercise and you get all those neurochemicals that are happy chemicals and I feel good after it like no one ever regrets a workout but my body doesn't actually want it. And I need to offer myself recovery. Otherwise I'm not gonna get the results I want. So there's a lot of that conversation in my brain of like, hey, we don't need to exercise today. You're good without it. You'll actually do better if you don't exercise. Let's do something slow and adding in more yoga and things like that. I think for me, I found getting out of that old routine is replacing that habit with something else, not just going cold turkey. Yeah. So you've got to slide in a different option. And the option for me is doing yin yoga. So I ended up buying a yoga mat the other day and I'm like, now I've got no excuse. I've always got something to do in that moment where I'm stressed and it's not high intensity exercise. It can be stretching. It can be laying around with an eye mask on. <laughs> it can be just folding over and doing some sort of like forward fold where it's really restorative. Um, that kind of stuff is starting to, to seep in a lot more. So it's more rest, relaxation and recovery as opposed to, I have to do a workout now to calm down. Wow. Usually it's difficult getting people in the gym, but you can't I've be kept out of the gym. The opposite <laughs> side. But I think there's a lot of people in the fitness industry that are that like are that inclined. Yeah. People don't really talk about it, right? I yeah. think that a lot of people share their struggles when it comes to like actually exercising, whereas like not a lot of people talk about over-exercising and what that can actually mean as well. Massively. And it's like it's it's detrimental too. Like it's such a great – outlet. Like I think that, you know, if you're feeling stressed or anxious or whatever you may be feeling at the time, the first thing you're like is like, I want to exercise. I think that is so healthy and so great, yeah. but also over-exercising as well can have its, its equally, as, yeah, equally its as detrimental. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So 
we have to wrap up really soon. Oh, I could talk for <laughs> days. Like I have so many more questions, but I think I'm going to just ask two more that I think that the listeners would take, uh, get a lot of value out of. And one that I think that you talk about a lot on your socials is just frequent nutrition mistakes people make when trying to lose weight. So talk me through what you think the top three are um, that people do that they don't realize are actually um, hindering their weight loss results. Sure. Okay. Um, I'll start, I'll go into a bit deeper detail, but I would say trying to go too quickly, trying to lose weight too quickly, massive thing that comes up all of the time. So setting correct expectations for the speed of weight loss is one of the things that I really try and get the message out on. Getting enough protein. We must talk about this all the time as nutritionists and dietitians and people on social media talk about protein all the time, but genuinely people are not eating enough. Yeah. Um, to to assist with weight loss and also just to thrive and make sure that they are getting healthy hair and things like that. Um, and then the third thing would probably be, it's my hot take, honestly. I think everybody's slightly different, but my hot take for people with cravings is to do a savory breakfast. Try it Ooh. once and just see how your cravings go throughout the day. There's a lot of misinformation on social about blood spiking, um, sorry, spiking of blood sugar and whether that's really detrimental. And there's a lot of, I think, negative talk about you shouldn't have oats in the morning anymore and all this crazy stuff. It really is bio-individual. But I find for a lot of clients, and this is honestly a lot of it's anecdotal, is that if we swap to a savory breakfast, the afternoon three o'clock I need chocolate bars diminishes drastically. Interesting. And I'll say to people, try it for one or two days. Just swap the brekkie. And even people say, oh, yeah, I actually didn't realize that happens because on a weekend when I go out for breakfast and I have eggs and toast, I realize that I don't generally reach for extra snacks. But when I'm at the office and in the morning when I have my overnight oats in that Monday to Friday period, I normally have like a sweet breakfast and then in the afternoon I'm reaching for nuts and biscuits and cakes or mid-morning. So it, it drastically changes from what I've seen, people's desire to continue to eat more throughout the day and just snack on things. So that's one of my favorite things, like hot take, really simple swap that I get people to do if they're struggling with extra snacks. Do you think that it could also just be serving size and volume? Because usually th items that are sweeter for breakfast um, are higher in fat. Yeah, um, and, less and, fat, and less protein. And less protein. And so yes. you feel hungrier throughout the day, so you snack more. I feel like when I have a savoury breakfast, which is most of the time, I usually go poached eggs on like uh, sourdough and smashed avo with chilli flakes. Um, I usually am like, oh, I could definitely eat my chocolate bar at 11 a.m. Because <laughs> I'm yeah. just like, I need that sweet. <laughs> but I find that it like... I sustain my like uh, my fullness for a lot longer because it just has just the the, the nutrient like, it's so nutrient dense as opposed to the lower protein uh, sweet breakfast options there are. Yeah, and you find often as well with savory that you hit fiber a lot easier because yeah, you're you generally having some veggies or some whole grain bread, yeah. um, and that's obviously fiber. Most people aren't getting enough, so if I had to add a fourth one to that list, it would be fiber yeah. because women should be aiming for between twenty five and thirty grams. Um, guys a little bit more, I they, think. What people actually consume versus what they should be consuming, protein and fiber. Shopping. And they're the two key things. Like if I said to someone, don't count your calories, just track protein intake and fiber, yeah. drastic in, in like um, kind of benefit in either weight yeah. loss or just feeling good and craving less. It makes massive shifts and people don't realize how much they under eat those things. They think they have a healthy diet and they might have what's considered nutrient dense, but it's not balanced in those two key areas. The other thing is water intake. We oh, talk yeah. about that all the time. But like, yeah. don't increase your fiber and, and then be drinking like three cups of water a day. That's yeah. not going to serve your gut no, health. Absolutely. So not. making sure you're drinking enough as well. Thank you so much, Sally. I do have one last question though. Um, reflecting on your journey, what's one piece of advice you would offer to your younger self about achieving balance and fulfillment in health and life? Not taking things to the extreme. Yeah. I think... I, I still haven't, I'm going to be really candid. I don't think I've nailed it with work. So I'm 
a person who loves, I will work on my business for like six weeks nonstop without a weekend. And I get to the stage where I'm like, I love this so much and I'm super excited and I just love helping people and seeing all these results. And I get so pumped off it. And then I'll hit burnout. I'll be like, I don't, I can barely take meetings today. I'm so tired. I just don't have the excitement for it. And I'll go on holiday, go away for like a weekend or I'll take myself off somewhere and I'll go with my laptop and I'll work a lot, which is crazy. And then I'll hit back to ground base and I'll be excited again. And I get these waves of enthusiasm. And in that same sense, I think, I shouldn't say it's a personality thing because I don't think that exists from a scientific perspective, but I very much like to be all in and, yeah. and perfectionism is my thing. So with a diet, I'll do it to the nth degree. I like, I want to be the person who hits the 1200 calories and no more or exercises the most or wants to be an athlete. Like, let's just take it to the extreme. And I think if I was to tell my, my younger self something, it's actually not healthy to be extreme in anything, whether it's a healthy pursuit. Yeah or not a healthy pursuit, trying to constantly chase dopamine hits is not gonna lead you to your best life. And actually reining that back in and finding things that soothe and calm you are really beautiful things to pursue as well as the fast hits and fun and excitement. You really need that balance. And that's in every area. That's in diet, that's in exercise, that's in work, that's in giving enough time to your personal relationships. You put too much effort and focus on one thing and everything else becomes off balance. So I think finding balance as much as possible with every area of your life really leads to a much happier you. And I think I've learned the really long road into understanding that. I would have loved a shortcut, but I didn't <laughs> we all make it. would have loved a shortcut, right? <laughs> but 80 20 in everything, right? Absolutely. So, not just nutrition, but in every aspect of life is so, so, so important. So important. And just living life with that philosophy when it comes to work, when it comes to exercise, when it comes to nutrition, whatever it may be, just yeah. having that very balanced approach just gives you so much more fulfillment. And I think allowing moments in your life, and this is probably a key point we haven't touched on but allowing moments in your life for it to be 70 30 yeah. and being okay with that and not being like you know what I'm throwing in the towel on all of it because I can't be at 80 20 because there's that extreme well if I can't do a little bit of it I'm just not going to do any of it yeah and 70 30 is fine as well it's better than 50 50 and there's mums out there that are getting no sleep that have got pressure on them that there's financial pressures they can't afford certain foods it's easier to get a mcdonald's or whatever that we really need to go, you know what, it's not okay to put this constant pressure on ourselves of finding the perfect way. And there's going to be days when I'm not at 80, 20, even though that's what I preach to people and being okay with that. I mean, like, you know what, it was a blip. It's all cool. It's an anomaly in my data collection service, you know, of like that, that day was great. That was on point. That was a normal day. And then we have, hey, it's pre-period. I'm 50, 50 today. Yeah. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah. Nobody is eating 80, 20 around the period and leaning into that. I mean, like, you know what? That's okay. Having the mental capacity to say this is okay. Yeah. That's where you want to be. Yeah. It's so empowering. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sally. Thank for you for having on. me. That was oh my amazing. Goodness, the I know best. there is just a lot of insight and valuable information our listeners can take from listening to this. And hopefully, we've managed to convince them that 1200 calories don't work. And Please they don't. Definitely not the don't answer. Don't go there. Yeah, not the answer. And always, always, if there's a parting message, just please lean into any symptoms that you feel are off. Yeah. So anything to do with periods, hair loss, mood swings, anything that comes up that may be diet related start writing them down, build up a picture, go to your GP, go to your specialist, go to your nutritionist, ask people. Like there is not a reason to be suffering through symptoms. Absolutely. And it's not normal to feel lethargic or it's fatigued not. or to feel low in energy. That is not normal. So yeah. there is something that is causing that. So try and pinpoint that. Self-reflection. comes from mm. your nutrition and your diet, right? Yeah. So thank you so much for joining thank me. Thank you. Guys, thank you for tuning in. I hope you loved this episode as much as I loved being a part of it. Uh, thank you for your support and I'll see you at the next one.